asked me to do this. He's not here today. He wants a picture of all y'all waving. Y'all wave it to God. What's up? And there's a photo bomb in the middle of it right there. So my name's Jason Price, a friend of Matthew Vanderell's, and there's a price to pay for being his friend. He is currently down in Florida with Rico Cortez, his mentor, and they're doing an intense study on, I think it's from the Bible Institute, a lot of the material would be, uh, but Daniel McGurr, some of these people that you're familiar with, um, they're doing a study on the temple. And what I find exciting about that is, if you guys ever looked at uh, Ezekiel 40 through 44, these are four chapters that go into pretty good detail about what the millennial reign temple will look like. Guys, we can read about that. It talks about the measurements and whatnot. Troy ought to do a teaching on that. He's an architect, or Dan one. And in chapter 43, it talks about uh, entrances and exits and who gets to come in and go out. And the Lord's speaking in first person. He's speaking Ezekiel. He says, go and teach the people these things. It's very important. Now, I don't know about you, but I know for me, any church I've ever been in, I haven't learned anything about the temple. Is the temple important? Yeah. Well, we know Yeshua was so excited about it. He called it his father's house. And it was one point in Scripture where he's very zealous. And he defends his father's house and his image from the den of robbers, the money exchangers. Our Lord and our King is excited about the Father's house, and here we haven't learned anything about it. I haven't learned anything about it. And so our pastor, Pastor Matt, is down there learning about it. So you can imagine what the next few series are going to be about, and rightfully so. I think, you know, when you and I came into Hebrew roots, if you will, one thing that we was really excited about was the feast days and all the mysteries that were hidden in there and all the deep meaning uh, even learning maybe about the Lord's birth, being on the first day of Feast of Tabernacles, and being circumcised on the eighth day, the great day. All these things are just interesting, and it actually shows um, a believer's walk from being redeemed uh, all the way into being given the Holy Spirit. I think the next bundle of mysteries can be found in the temple, the sacrificial system and some of the processes that the priests had to walk through. So, guys, I'm looking forward to when Matt comes back and shares these things. I, otherwise, am not so savvy with ancient Near East and ancient Mesopotamia and Babylonia. My friends and family know that I like to talk about relationships, interpersonal relationships, um, marriages, and today, arguments. I want to talk to you all about arguments. Matt's always looking for his clicker. Bam, there's my clicker. How you like that? I love you, buddy. So arguments, it's an interesting thing because I want to go one more step. Go one more. I want to, Eric and I were talking in the back, and I asked, did Yeshua ever argue? Now, don't answer that too quickly. He got into discussions. Um, he corrected a lot, even with some whips. Did he argue? Eric posed back. He said, um, depends on what, what you mean by the argument. And I'm sitting there thinking, well, an argument like I've had with my wife, every one of us had a good old juicy argument. I'm going to take the position. I don't think Yeshua ever argued. And it's an interesting thing because a lot of times when people are arguing, probably the majority of the time they're arguing, arguing they're just wanting to be right. They're just wanting to prove their point. And I heard one counselor teacher, and I should stop right here and go on to tell you that where I'm coming from is a guy named Gene Wagstaff and some other mentors have, uh, I went to many of their classes talking about counseling. And a lot of counseling courses I was taking was for the lay person so that you could share with others and help others in the church rather than them going to the pastor or deacon. They'll speak to uh, a church mate. And so Gene Wagstaff, my mentor, he, he was talking. He said, you know, if I'm arguing with my spouse, and dadgummit, 
she, God knows who's right. If there's going to be anyone right, God would know. He knows the truth. He knows what's correct. But that's not good enough. you got to know I'm right. you got to know. So he posed the idea, this may be flirting with idolatry. I said, Gene, what do you mean? He said, it's not enough that the Father knows what's right or who's right, that you have to have this man know that you're right or this spouse. Did you just put them above God? It's a thought, it's an interesting thought. Well, I want to talk about the, these arguments. Um, if you should have never entered into an argument like I have had with my spouse, friends, coworkers, or supervisors, then one would say that it takes at least two to argue. So everyone involved, every party involved is guilty for this argument. For what's the point of the argument? Yeshua never argued the way that I've argued, going back and forth, who's right, who's wrong. Uh, it's an interesting thing. So I want to talk about the sustainers of an argument. First one being buttons and triggers. I talk a lot about buttons and triggers to my friends and family. And just talking today ain't going to be enough talking about buttons and triggers. You need a two-week conference on buttons and triggers. Buttons or a trigger is when your unconscious mind controls your life and the conscious mind doesn't know anything about it. You've, every one of us have those friends or family members, coworkers, who you know not to do certain things or say certain things to them because they're going to flip on you. What is that flip? That's what I'm referring to as the trigger. We've triggered them. And where does this come from? Well, we all learn our vocabulary, our mannerisms, our way of living and interacting in life from a childhood up. The mind begins to fill out a definition of what it feels like to be this or that or to feel this or that. And those times are usually with guardians, parents, teachers, strong authority figures in your life. And so sometimes it gets filled out, this definition gets filled out incorrectly. Let me give an example, better example. I'm going to talk about little Johnny. This ain't a little Johnny joke, if y'all are familiar. I'll talk about little Johnny. Little Johnny's about seven or eight years old. Uh, he's in his bedroom. It's time to go to bed. He's tired, but he wants a drink of water. So he steps out of his bedroom, and he walks across a dark living room, and the TV's on. He looks at the TV, and it's, uh, it's a funny little commercial. So he stands there looking at it. It's funny. And as he's standing there, about that time, uh, Dad smacks him in the back of the head. Boy, you worthless. Get out of the way. Little Johnny's frazzled, definitely frazzled. Little Johnny runs back to his room crying. It's very emotional. It's very impressive to the mind and the memory. In the way, worthless. These definitions have now been filled out. His subconscious has now recorded how he feels. The temperature of his body, every part of his experience has been recorded in his subconscious, and it's now attached to being in the way and worthless. Well, Johnny is now about 25 years old. Now, here's the funny thing about these buttons and triggers. The conscious mind don't always know about them. The conscious mind experiences, you experience, you know when you're triggered, but you don't know why. Uh, I chew my fingers, don't know why. Some people have road rage, don't really know why. Little Johnny's 25, and let's say he's working for a newspaper. And he writes a column. He's finished writing his column, submitted it to the editor. The editor looks through it. The editor don't like some of these uh, things he's saying. He's wanting it to be cited, and he don't like the format of some... Little Johnny. Johnny. John. John, look here. I want you to cite some of this stuff. I, wherever you got this information and um, the format, I think this should be down here. And this, I need you to rework this thing. I can't put this in right now. Right now, it's worthless. I can't take this right now. John has just heard the word worthless. Unconscious, unconscious mind knows exactly what that is. It pulls it out. It opens that folder. 
And all those feelings come back. Now, this is not a conscious process. Mind you, this is a subconscious process. Those same feelings that he felt when he was eight years old, that frustration, that hurt, all that welling up. Now, he's not necessarily knowing where it's coming from. If you ask Johnny right then, who's making you feel like that? That jerk, that editor. What a jerk. Johnny, I've been working with you for a long time too, man. He does that to everybody. It's just the way he is. No, man, he is, he's a jerk. Is there any way you could tell Johnny right then, your dad did this to, did this to you? Not at that moment. Little Johnny's blaming the editor. And he feels all that pain and all that hurt. Imagine if that editor got into a dialogue with him and they actually got into an argument. It's almost unfair. Little Johnny is having to deal with so much other stuff completely unrelated to this column in this argument. Oh boy, might get wrote up. Might lose his job. Or because of these conflicts, little Johnny may be a job hopper. And that might be a theme that goes over and over in his life because he's got this trigger that he doesn't know anything about. Now let's go on. Little Johnny, little Johnny goes home. And he's cooking in the kitchen with his wife. They're flirting, bumping butts, making spaghetti. And at some point, she's wanting to put something in the oven. Johnny, scoot over. You in the way. In the way. Subconscious mind opens that folder. We know what it feels like to be in the way, don't we? And he feels something. It might not be as intense. People feel something. He, even he knows something ain't right, but he's like... <clears throat> Tell you what, honey, I'm going to go in here and watch the news. Just let me know when this is done, all right? And he walks off because he knows he shouldn't respond to his wife. She hadn't done anything wrong. His conscious mind is fighting against his unconscious feelings that was coming up. And here he's walked into the living room. Now, what we don't know is that his wife, she's got a trigger too, abandonment. For someone just to walk out on her without a really good explanation, she starts wondering a lot of stuff. Her mind starts going nuts because she's been abandoned as a child, too, in some instance. And she's got a trigger. Now we've got all these dynamics happening, and no one even knows why. So when you understand when a person is triggered, it's almost an unfair battle at this point because they're contending. You should be able to detect when someone's triggered. Back off. Just, just back off. Don't continue in the argument. Don't continue in the discussion. Don't continue in the conflict. They've got other things to deal with. And if you care about them, and you might not, granted, some coworkers, some bosses, but if you do care about them, hey, man, you all right? What, what did I say that triggered you? They may know. They may not know. Now, we begin a bunny trail down another path I'd love to share sometime. But what I want to point out is in an argument or in a conflict, if you detect a trigger, the argument's a mute point anymore. You, you have to stop. You have to walk away. And you have to deal with that long before you can continue uh, this argument or working it out. Love that. That's pretty cool, isn't it? One of the other sustainers of arguments is uh, pride. It's a funny thing. We all got this ego. Every single one of us are guilty of this. Um, even the most mature. I like to think that I'm a student of this thing, and I find myself here plenty. I'm frustrated because I recognize I'm in it, and I, how do I get out of it? If the wife and I get into a discussion, argument, whatever it be, and you just want to be right. Why is that? Why do you just want to be right? For some people, that becomes the trophy. That becomes the highest priority. The issue doesn't even matter. Uh, these folks are going to fight for you to hear their point. They're probably not interested in your point. They may be interested in your point just enough to argue back, get a little more ammunition, but not because they care. And I shouldn't even talk about them. It could be yourself doing the same thing. A sustainer of an argument can be pride or ego. You don't care about the issue. You just want to be right. Um, and your priority is no longer trying to solve the problem at hand or get through the issue. You need to recognize this. Have got any teenagers in here? Teenagers? This is when, in the teens, is when you start contending with uh, strong emotions. Recognize this. When you're in an argument with your parents, <laughs> I can guarantee you most parents 
aren't looking for an argument with their kids. It's really a headache. I'm going to let that hit where it may. <laughs> Teenagers, just shut up and listen. Just listen. It's the rank you're in right now, but you're going to be in this other position. It's the learning experience. But when you're in a discussion or argument, even with your spouse, coworker, try to check and see if you're just trying to be right. Man, <laughs> this is a hard thing to do, but practice it. Everyone should practice it. Admitting you're wrong. When I started doing this, I started doing this as a student. Gene Wagstaff, I was, this was some seven, eight years ago, taking these counseling courses, learning to apologize, learning to get through issues, buttons, and triggers. And I made a decision that I wanted to be a better spouse. And uh, Gene Wagstaff spoke a lot about how to be a better spouse. And I think that was about the time things changed for us. And I had made a personal decision. I'm going to be the best spouse she could ever have. If she ever left me, she's going to lose. I'm the one. <laughs> because I'm going to be willing to apologize. Now, to me, I also study personality types. We won't get into all that. I love talking about that. But my type is um, very analytical, pretty absolute. Okay, I'm wrong. Before, I would continue arguing. Okay, now I recognize I'm wrong. Or the argument's not worth it, and I want to get her back. Because it's bedtime. I'll say, Katie, my bad. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I see your point. In some instances, you're right. I'm sorry. And when I first started doing this, I had resolved to do it already. So that when the occasion rose up, I just made the decision to apologize. She said, you don't mean it. I'm like, uh, I might mean it in a little while. I'm trying to walk it out, you know. <laughs> motion, then emotion. Isn't that how it works? And so I wanted to just consciously, I'm sorry. I want to end this argument. You're more valuable than the argument. Or you're right and I'm wrong and I'm, I'm coming to terms with it. I'm sorry. It's taking time. Even now, she's, she's just skittish on accepting it because I'm so quick for it. And it's true. You might not feel it right away. But who's driven by emotions is weak. You don't need to be driven by emotions. Emotions are great. That's the seasoning on the, on the entree, but it's not the meat of the matter. The meat of the matter is the conscious decisions that you make. And the decision was to apologize, and I want to feel the remorse later. And I do. My point being is, uh, make the conscious decision. I am willing to step down, apologize, concede. And here's another novel piece. This is learning to be okay with someone not agreeing with you. This was a big one for me. I used to think... If you didn't agree with me, we still in this. <laughs> and my wife had it too. We both fought with it. And it's coming in terms of, listen, if, if it's not this huge issue, if it's not the type of house that we're going to be moving in, if it's something that we can work with, agree to disagree. It's okay. Who wants to be married to themselves anyway? You want someone who's different, who views things different. It's okay. Have you ever noticed older couples that's been married for a while? They can tolerate this kind of thing. Yeah, she's always like this, and we've done that kind of thing. And it's nice to hear them talk because they're okay with the other one being a person of their own. So coming to a place where you don't have to not only be right, them completely vote the way you vote, and you rule the world. It doesn't have to be that way. Be humble. Realize you're one person among many free agents. These other people with free will, and they've got opinions too. Make this conscious decision. I keep saying this over for a reason. I really want to get it to you. That it's the one big thing that can save a lot of arguments. Because most arguments are this one here. Most arguments are somebody just trying to be right. Here's another little interesting thing I was talking to Bethany about. A lot of people 
just want to be validated. They just want to know that they've been heard. Now, I'm a supervisor of the CAT scan and MRI department at the local hospital in Rock Hill. And uh, it's the first rung of management. So I'm working with the people that I'm having to manage. Now, that's tough. No office, right? Conflict everywhere. We're in closed quarters working 40, 50 hours a week. And conflict comes up a lot. What I've learned from these guys, no one wants, when you're in an argument, people are always wanting to be the one talking. I want you to hear my point. I want you to hear my point. I want you to, everybody's trying to get the floor to speak. What I've learned is if you shut up and dare to try to listen, dare to try to understand their point rather than it's called listening to understand rather than listening to respond. You want to listen to understand without the agenda of I'm looking for a punch back. Give me something so I can turn it around and stab you back. No. Put your agenda down and listen. I think any good supervisor does this. Any good authoritarian does this. Parents to a child. When you let them completely get it out, and then don't start talking. Have some silence in there because that lets them dig a little deeper. If there's little morsels, pick it up and they'll throw it at you. They got to get it out. Uh, you got to get the pus out of a wound before you can put salve on it, don't you? So let this passionate person who's really contending for their position, their perspective, they want to get it out. Let them. Let them completely get it out. A few things. One, it shows you care. And you should. The other thing is, you're actually more empowered now because everything they've got to throw at you, they've already put down, and you could pick it up. That's the wrong thing to do. But now you see the full issue. It is then that they're willing to listen. Actually, there's one more step. You need to tell them what you just heard, and it don't have to be verbatim. A lot of these things I'm talking to you all about, you've heard before. Active listening, giving feedback to what you just heard. Um, it's really important because it shows a heart. It shows caring. Another thing, nobody cares what you know until they know that you care. Y'all have heard that? It's kind of a neat little uh, slogan to say. In this instance, you actually care about that listener. I'm listening. I hear you. You want to go a step further? Start writing stuff down, taking notes. Then they really feel like you're really digging in to listen to what they have to say. And at the end, now, and only now, are they positioned to receive. It's a funny thing. Um, when you've got a hurt inside you, or you've got something that you... All y'all got wives, dude. Y'all got the wives. Y'all know they got the... Don't, they like to process And you've been told, don't try to fix it. Just listen. There's an interesting thing about human nature. The only way you can get some of these hurts out is through an ear. You don't find anyone who needs to talk and process things going up to a tree and talking. They might get desperate and talk to their dog. At least it moves. But we like to share with our friends, our confidants, those that we can talk to. Because it's the ear that all things are draw, drawn out of a person. It needs to be a confidential ear and an ear that cares. So learning to listen. All right. The third one. What do we got? Sometimes arguments are over legitimate issues. And this is tough. Um, I took a course talking about critical conversations when the stakes are high. That's not original. And it happens a lot at work. I want to describe a situation. Now, I'm going to use work as an example, but I think you can all find an example in your own home and your own lives. We have to do so many patients to justify how many uh, employees we can have at any given time, productivity. And this is a real instance that happened some, I don't know, 10, 15, uh, about 10 years ago. We got to increase our productivity. We got to increase the availability for patients to come through. We've got a commitment to the community. And we don't want patients having to wait a week before they can get a CAT scan. We want them to wait no more than a day or two days. So what are we going to do? Easy. Buy another CAT scan machine. No, we ain't buy another CAT scan machine. Well, how about uh, more employees? No, you're not going to get more employees either. So you want to keep the employees and keep the equipment, or quality is going to drop. Well, that's not okay either. We actually had a problem. Have to do more work, 
same resources, keep quality the same. Doesn't sound like things are going to work out that well. Did I lose my guy? I lost my guy. Eric, hit that right arrow button for me. I want to talk a little bit about this one. That's right. Heather, here's your chart. What this little graph's going to be, I want to illustrate the value of a relationship versus the value of an issue. I'm going to get back to the productivity problem that we had in CAT scan. In a relationship, anytime we get into a conflict, now relationships can be very superficial. It can be the newsboy who's throwing a newspaper at your door, or it could be your spouse, someone you're very close to. Well, if you get into a conflict with somebody that you have very little concern for the relationship, and the issue is small too, what we tend to do is avoid it. We'll avoid the conflict. There you go. You think about this part, this coworker, in-law, sorry mom. In these instances, you come across somebody and you don't care about their, the relationship, you don't care about the issue, and they want to fight about it, you don't even engage. You don't even draw the sword. Done with you. But what about when you care a lot about the relationship and the issue is just not that big a deal and you're in a conflict? Then we're going to accommodate. So if wife and I get into a little friction and I think about it, I'm like, this ain't a big deal. This is dumb. Yeah, baby, let's go ahead and do that. Whatever. And that's most things in my life. Whatever. This is just whatever. Whatever. But I want you to think of an example of when the issue is extremely important and a relationship isn't. We compete. Now in this instance, one of the examples that came to my mind is those little fellows that ride the bicycle with the tie and come knock on your door and they want to talk about your religion. That's a big, big issue. It's very valuable. And you don't know this cat. He just showed up and he wants to talk about your religion. Evangelism's tough. Um, some of us will invite them in and dare compete with them. <laughs> and talk about Scripture and the Word of the Good Lord. Somewhere in the middle of this, we compromise. A compromise is where you just, you're going to give, they're going to give, whoever you're in conflict with or working through a conflict with, argument. And the sign of a good compromise is everyone leaves the table unhappy. You think about it. You're not getting what you want. You might get 60, 70% of it. They might get some degree. If somebody leaves the table happy, they cheated. You didn't get enough. This is very unsatisfying. This is kind of the state of affairs when it comes to international communications. America with the other countries, we just compromise these things. Everybody wants to rule the world. Why can't everyone leave the table happy? What would that be? <laughs> Somebody got to accommodate. Somebody going to lose, right? Let's do one more. I want to take this word collaboration, polish it up, and introduce you to it again. It is powerful for your family. It is powerful for your workplace. It's powerful for your congregation and your fellow man. See, collaboration is a real interesting thing. With collaboration, everyone can leave the table happy. Now, you all may be familiar with this word, but I'm going to reintroduce it to you. See, the way you collaborate, what if... I can explain to y'all a way that everybody, every time you got into a conflict, you could leave happy. There's a technique to step toward that. There is a framework in place. I want to share it with you. It's called creating the big question. If, now these are instances when it's a legitimate problem and we're not dealing with some crazy buttons and triggers, and we're not dealing with some pride and ego issues over here, but we got some legitimate people in conflict and they got a problem, they got to get through it. Here's how to do it and leave happy. See, everybody needs their concerns considered. Well, you form the big question. 
The big question is when you take the elements from everyone at the table, one or many, you write them out. And you make one question out of it. The question that I had to develop in the CAT scan department was, how can I accommodate more patients, accommodate doing more patients without hiring more staff or more CAT scan machines and keep the same level of quality or increase it? See, the big question is also a hard question, but it's only one question. And then you can begin to look for the solution. I can tell you at the end of our solution is we went to an electronic health record where instead of having x-ray films, everything was on a computer, processes were much faster. So the answer wasn't the equipment, it wasn't the staff, it was the process. But we didn't even consider that at first. Just give me more people, give me more machines. Looking at the process, we was completely able to redefine it, uh, bring in some computer equipment. It was a big overhaul. It was the time that uh, all hospitals were switching over to EHR, electronic health record. And in doing so, film went away. Costs went down. Quality skyrocketed because you can now do quality control much easier. All the concerns were met, but not before we had a problem, one problem, the problem to solve. So, <laughs> about 25 years old, this is when Katie and I probably started getting more involved in church as a married couple, young married couple. And uh, this girl wanted to pay tithes. On our budget, she was going to school. I think she was going to school at that time. I was working. We had an apartment. 10%. Well, we were growing in our faith, and we know that that's the next mature step is when a person gives. I did it for you, Matt. Just teasing. But looking at the budget, I was really frustrated. Uh, she's wanting us to give 10%. That's a chunk. Uh, I mean, if you do it right, you're supposed to do it before all your bills and stuff. Oh, Lord. Lord, I got a problem with this. We got a conflict. So we had to develop a question. Now then, I didn't know what I know now. And uh, I know we struggled through it. Had I known some of these things, maybe we could have made the big question. And for you, the question might be, maybe for a husband, how do I take this wife on the vacation that she wants? We got some kid about to graduate, or maybe we have a car to buy. We have some kind of financial obligations coming up. And then there's these time obligations. We got work, call, whatever it be. You've just got these elements that are conflicting. Bring it into one question. Make it one question. And only then, and don't be intimidated once you make the question. Once you make the question, you can begin the journey for the solution. And the solution will often bubble up as you're making the question. Guys, this is the framework of collaboration. Because inadvertently, when you solve the question and everybody's concerns are built into it, then everybody's got all their concerns addressed. And the interesting thing is, as I'm getting what I want, she's getting what she wants, this person's getting what they want, everybody's winning together. And also the one question brings everybody into a unity of one big problem. Now it's not me trying to fight for me alone. Now all of us are fighting this one big problem together. And inadvertently, the solution comes and everybody's happy. This tool of collaboration is overlooked a lot in the marriage. Junior Wagstaff once said something to me. I'm just taking a little snippet out of a big old training. He used to say, you should never tell your spouse no unless they're asking you to sin. Do what, Gene? Everything my wife asks I'm supposed to do? Yep. Gene, don't understand that. You're crazy, Gene. Gene, if I'm on a $5 an hour uh, budget job and she wants to go to Hawaii, you don't tell her no, son. You have to explain that one to me, Gene. Gene went on to, there's about 20 people in the class. They had a class clown. But Gene went on to explain, he said, Jason, what you do is you sit down with them. You sit down with them and you begin to go over, what's it going to take to make, you want to go to, you really want to go? You really want to go. Okay. How, how much it's going to cost? 
and you start seeing y'all's budget, and you start talking about, you know, we might be able to do this. Seriously, it might take about 10 years. It'll be the one big trip you take in life, and we'll have to forego some, some clothes and new furniture. I mean, furniture is a big one, or a new car. Um, let's forego some of these things. If it's important to you, it's important to me. It's not me just saying, I don't want to go. You don't just stop moving forward. She wants to go. Well, once you've done that, one of two things are going to happen. Well, number one, right away, she's going to feel like you care, that you've taken the time. Oh, and when you're doing this, don't be a jerk about it. I mean, be involved. Be connected. One of the two things is they're going to say, it doesn't quite look like it's worth it. Wow, eh, flights are pretty expensive. That's rough. Maybe we can go to Bahamas, the east side Hawaii, right? <laughs> Something cheaper. Or she's going to say, yep, I do still want to go. And now you see how big a deal it is to them. Okay, honey, I loved you. I loved you enough to marry you, give up a kidney, whatever it takes. You want to go to Hawaii, no furniture? So be it. After that, I want a tractor. Now that moves into my next little example. I hope they never see this video. I had a friend, I used to sell rainbow vacuum cleaners. And Katie actually went and sold this one for me. Thank you, baby. It was a coworker I had who, uh, she saw it, she really liked it. Bought the $2,400 rainbow vacuum cleaner. Her husband wasn't a bit interested. He could live in dirt. He don't care. Why are you spending 24? Go ahead. He valued the relationship more than the issue. $2,400. She bought the thing. I saw her at work the uh, next few days and weeks. So what you think? Oh, I love it. What your husband think? He's fussing about it a little bit. He wants a tractor. A tractor? Don't y'all live in the city? Yeah, we live in the city. What's he want to do with a tractor? She goes, I don't know. Y'all going to get a tractor? No, we can get a tractor. How come? There ain't no point in this tractor. I said, but he wants the tractor. She said, it's dumb. I'm like, you think it's dumb? He don't think it's dumb. I said, wait a minute now. This used tractor, we have some four, six thousand dollars, something, not quite the same as a rainbow, but nevertheless expensive. <laughs> he wants this tractor. Why wouldn't you want the tractor with him or for him? She goes, I don't want to spend it. Oh, money, oh, crazy tractor. I said, rainbow vacuum, stupid. I mean, really? So I said, you know, if you valued him, wouldn't y'all look at it and see what it would take for him to get his rainbow vacuum cleaner, his tractor? Even though it can't do a whole lot? I mean, that's a stupid vacuum cleaner. They bought a tractor. Talk actually worked. That was amazing. He ended up renting it out, going to do little dumb jobs, and then he sold it. <laughs> took, took him about two years. But the fact of the matter is, she went along with him. I like to think that she kind of grew a little in that place. And she's definitely the alpha in the home. See, that stinks. When you're the alpha in the home and you won't concede to the desires of the other person, you just put that person in prison. That's not right. That's not right. Value the other person. What's my next slide? I forget what my next slide is. Oh. <coughs> So when you get in these conflicts, and these conflicts don't have to be heated. They can be over a discussion of a, a, a large purchase, a vacation, tractor. Keep the highest goal. And the highest goal is keeping the relationship. If you don't care about the relationship, what was the option? Avoid or compete? I want to talk to you about the, va the relationships you care about, your spouse. Coworker that you do care about on most days, but you're in a conflict today. The highest goal is to keep the relationship, keep peace, and care. Give a darn about the other person's view. Let them express it. Tell it back to them. Consider it. And you don't have to agree with it. You can say, I see your point. Point, 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 point. But I still don't subscribe to it for this reason. Will you hear my side now? And hopefully they've learned by your example because you've done it first. And you share it all. Not arguing back and forth, but sharing, putting it out there on the table. 
And if there's any common ground, you can take that and collaborate and get a solution for that piece. Other option. I love the don't listen with the intent to respond, but listen with the intent to understand. I got into a pretty big fight with a radiologist about two weeks ago. I could do that because I'm kind of in with him a little bit. These doctors were yelling at me, two of them yelling at me. I was yelling back at them. And uh, in the end, it took about 10 minutes. In the end, we came up with this, this solution. And I chuckled about it, and they did too, about how simple it was. I wouldn't listen to them, they wouldn't listen to me. This is me and her. We was going at it. Me against doctors. Arr. The next day I actually came in, I told Dr. Leonard, Doc, I actually learned a lot from you. I really appreciate that. He goes, man, I'm glad I can talk to you like that. Don't get me wrote up. I said, but you know, I didn't listen to you. You didn't listen to me. We didn't listen to each other. Had we listened, we'd have got that solution 30 seconds in. I said, yeah, you're right. It's just about some paperwork and a workflow. Um, listen with the intent to understand. People don't listen until they believe they've conveyed their position. This is the validation part. I'm, I'm, I must be, this is the area I'm still working on. Katie often tells me, because she seems to repeat herself until she drives that point home. But obviously, I'm not saying back to her, I understand. I hear your point, because I'm usually kind of the quiet one. But I'm not conveying to her that I've heard what she said. You know, if she doesn't feel like she's been heard, what she's going to do again? So could it be that nagging wives have husbands who won't convey back that they've heard what they've said. You're not nagging. <laughs> I agree to disagree. I'm teasing, I'm teasing. Many people simply need the validation not to win the argument. If the other person believes you care about their concerns, a solution is always achievable. It's always available. If you can get that person to believe that you care about them, they'll put their sword down and they'll be a little bit more willing, even if it's a brat, even if it's a teenager, even if it's a spouse who has an ego problem, so on and so forth. If you want to dismantle the whole thing, listen, show that you care, and that you'll be that much closer to a solution. It may be a compromise still, and you may not be getting as much as you would like to have, but you can get through the argument as long as they feel like you care. Guys, this ultimately completes all my slides. But I want to think about this whole argument thing. You know, the number one reason in America for divorce, irreconcilable differences. Now, that might just be the first thing on the menu when the attorney selects it on the little online form, probably because it's most popular. Irreconcilable differences. You know, somebody who got a divorce... I don't know if anybody here has ever been through such a thing. He's got that past, and a lot of religious people give you a hard time about that divorce thing. God got a divorce. Jeremiah 3 8. He divorced Israel for a lot of adultery. And we came to a place where, you know why he did it? Irreconcilable differences. Y'all wouldn't keep worshiping other gods, adultery. Irreconcilable differences. But we got one who reconciles us all. So Yeshua, indeed, reconciled us and the Father. He is the Prince of Peace. That's right. This whole message is not riddled with a bunch of scriptures. But I hope you can see the Torah principles in it. It's peace, it's tools. Guys, we're going to be in a kingdom forever. And we're going to be getting along with each other forever. And arguments are still going to happen. Because you know the rabbis know scripture better than us. And that's all they did, right? It's funny because in Hebrew roots, there ain't no shortage of arguments and fussing and getting my point across and lots of ego. Uh, I've learned I'm more interested in the person now. Sometimes if you can show that you care about that person, you can get through the differences.
Hey guys, I'm Matthew Vanderels, pastor of Founded in Truth Fellowship, and I hope you enjoyed this message. If you'd like to see more messages and teachings like this one, uh, consider subscribing to our YouTube channel by clicking this link right here. You can also leave some comments below. I know the staff at Founded in Truth loves to see positive feedback for the messages and teachings that we put out, so thank you for that ahead of time. Also, you can check out our website to find out more information about the ministry by clicking this link over here. And if this me message uh, or teaching has been edifying to you or your family, uh, I would ask you to consider consider financially supporting fit, maybe sending a donation or an offering. It helps keep these messages online uh, and available for those who might find themselves far from God. And you can do that through our smart giving portal right here. Guys, our mission at Founded in Truth is simple. Uh, our mission is to spread the gospel of Yeshua through the historical, cultural, and biblical evidence of the God of Israel by taking the forgotten truths of God's word to the nations. This is to be laid as the foundation of all truth. Found in Truth yearns to facilitate a gathering of believers who seek one thing, and that is the ancient paths referred to in Jeremiah 6.16. Will you join us on this mission? I hope so. I pray that you will continue seeking truth so that the light of God will shine through you and for the sake of the kingdom of our Savior, Yeshua. Shalom.